wasn't a it wasn't him just entertaining or cutting a promo. It was him legitimately saying how I felt. And um, when someone else is putting words in your mouth, it doesn't come across that way. Exactly. You know? And uh, yeah. so it, it's again, I'm not adverse to uh, improve changes and improvements. I mean, you know, I've I've done I did some things with television in southeastern wrestling back in the mid '70s that are commonplace now, and people told me it wouldn't work. And so I'm not adverse to changes or innovations, but wrestling should still be wrestling. And, uh, you know, it, the entertainment has overcome that. And, and so, you know, so many great workers in the 60s and 70s, I, I say it all the time, there, there are names that I could mention that no one would recognize the name. They say, who's that? You know, mm-hmm. they never seen a magazine. But the guy, would, you know, they were great, great wrestlers, performers, uh, workers. And, uh, again, in part because we were going, you know, five, six, seven nights a week. It's funny. It's funny you mentioned five, six nights a week because I spoke with uh, Scotty Riggs uh, a few months ago on, on an episode, and you know he 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 cut his teeth in uh, in Jerry Lawler's territory in USWA, and he said the exact same thing. Like you gotta you gotta hone your craft, and you know he was working six, seven nights a week as well, and that's how you know he you know honed the skills, and he became like you know a much better wrestler like when he went to uh, the WCW. So, well, sure. You know, it, it's it's funny now. Uh, to work with some of these kids. Harley has said the same thing, Steamboat as well. Um, things that we never actually talked about or things that the old timers never actually sat down and told us to do or not to do, they were just, they just happened. They were commonplace because we were going. So, I mean, well, you know, if you went to the ring now, you know, it's, it amazes me that some kid will come in who's still wet behind the ears, uh, you know, and, and with some veteran and say, well, you know, I, uh, here's what I've wanted. You, you know, I never, I never went open my mouth when I first <laughs> broke in this business. And I, when finally somebody asked my opinion, I said, "Am I really allowed to have one?" Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and that's the thing too. When I say this, it wasn't like, you know, somebody beat somebody up every night, but uh, you don't. There's not the veterans that that run the locker rooms now like there used to be. You know, uh, back then, you uh, well, I'll give you a good example. Uh, when I first left. New England and came back here to home. Uh, I went to work for Jim Barnett in the Indianapolis Territory. My first booking was on Indianapolis Television. And I walked into the dressing room, and here was Fritz Von Erich, Dick the Bruiser, the original Sheik, Angelo Papa, who was Randy Savage's dad, uh, Joe Blanchard. I bought tickets to watch all these guys, right? And uh, I said my hellos and sat down and shut my mouth. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, and I worked with, I worked on, on the taping with Papo, and then I worked a live match with the Sheik. And I wouldn't have uttered a word. I mean, they said, you know, just, and, and that's all you had. You went out there, and the veteran led. Mm-hmm. And you learned, you know. Uh, and that's the problem now. There are no, uh, the, the best thing that happened for me when I had the WWE uh, developmental was that at that time, uh, some of the guys on the main roster that weren't being utilized were sent down to me uh, to use on shows and to work with my kids. And uh, like, uh, at, you know, one point, Tommy Dreamer, Dilo Brown, Val Venus, uh, you know, four or five of these guys every, you know, were with, on my crew all the time. And like, we would do our television on Sunday down at OVW, then we'd come back up here to Cincinnati, and I'd bring a rough cut of the tape. And on Monday, after we finished training, we would sit down and watch the tape and it was like sort of like a, you know, a American Idol side type of thing because uh, myself and I say Haku and Val and Dilo, uh, we would pick. You know, everybody saw the matches from a different set of eyes, and we would stop the tape at the end. Okay, this was wrong. This was right. This should have been changed. And it was, you know, it was like going to school. And that's the other thing too. When I, you know, when somebody says I have a wrestling school and they train once a week, congratulations. <laughs> uh, that's not much value. Uh, with, with, I had four organized training sessions a week. If you were going to work, if you were working on my shows, you were expected to be at the three of those four every week. Right. Or you didn't get booked. And that would include Nigel McGinnis or Shark Boy or any of the guys that you might have heard, you know, that, that I trained. Uh, it didn't matter. And uh, with WWE guys, our developmental training sessions ran three hours a day. And, uh, Sunday we had television, we trained Monday, 
uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Tuesday we called Bumpless Tuesday because we ran a show in-house on Tuesday night. But Tuesday afternoon, instead of running the, practice, uh, the in-ring sessions, we would work on promos and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, the guys are, who are in the WWE developmental are down at OVW now with uh, TNA. They are training every day. And, uh, again, you know, you can think, you know, I, I know a lot of kids say, well, gee, I, I want to move up. How one of the first things I ask Richard when I do a training camp, I was ask, I, how many of you here like to go to WWE? And of course, every hand in the place goes up. Right? Yeah, that's right. How many of you here? Yeah, how many of you here are in the ring three times a week or more? And a few hands went up. I mm-hmm. said, well, if you didn't raise your hand on the second question, you're spinning your wheels when you raise your hand on the first one. Right. Because there's, you know, you 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 just can't your timing and, and your perception of the business can't develop and, and become sharp unless you're in that ring, you know, consistently. So so what do you think is like a good a good respectable amount of time for these kids that are in NXT and OVW to to the train before they go to the big promotions? Because I don't know, in my opinion it seems that some of these guys are lagging. Like they're they're you know, they're stuck in NXT for literally four or five, six years, like guys like Richie Steamboat and like do you think that's a you know a respectable amount of time? I don't think there's any set amount of time. That was one of the things that bothered me when when I was under contract either to WCW or WWE uh, was, you know, you expect everybody's different. You have a driver's license and I have a driver's license. Mm-hmm. How how long did it take you to actually become a proficient enough driver to pass your test? And the chances are, if you ask ten people it'll be a different time for each one. That's right. So there is, you know, it's not it's not an assembly line thing. There's no set time. Uh, the shortest period of time I ever turned a guy out, well, except Nigel had to run back and forth between England and, and the States anyway. So, I mean, that took longer, obviously, than it should have, uh, not by his fault or mine, but because of the, the, you know, uh, the visa type, the visa thing. But... Um, one of the best athletes I had, one of the most intense and most serious, he was still six months before he had his first match. Uh, that wasn't a, that wasn't a time limit set, but uh, you know, one of the things too, I, I never wanted to put guys out uh, before their time that, you know, where you basically saw a, a neon sign and said green, right? This is his first <laughs> match. I don't know if you've seen the MTV special that our school was featured in. Um, was that the uh, Wrestling Society X? Is, was that True the... Life? I'm a pro wrestler. Uh, I've heard of it. I, I haven't seen it. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, uh, Rory Fox uh, was a young man who has, you know, the, the whole thing was about Triple H and China at the time uh, ascending to the top of their craft. It was Tony Atlas, who had been there and his struggles to maintain and stay in the business on the other side of that and. My young guy, Roy Fox, was obviously coming up. Well, they, uh, and, and the, the thing ran uh, an hour, and um, at, at the end, it, it showed a, a thing with Triple H in China, and it showed Tony, and then it showed Roy having his first match. Uh, and I have been accused, well, I've been accused a lot of things, but I've been accused of, of holding guys out too long. But again, uh, I'm not interested in the fans watching him screw up. You know, I, I don't think that's beneficial to him or, or me or anybody else. But anyway, the point I'm getting at is uh, at that show that particular night, a lady named Phyllis Lee who had managed uh, Dan Severn for a while in, MM, in UFC and she had worked with uh, uh, Larry Simon, Dean Malenko's dad, with his school down in Tampa. And anyway, she had, she lives up in northern Ohio uh, a few hours from me. She had come down for the show. And uh, after the show was over, she mentioned that Rory, she said, wow, the kid's, uh, he's pretty good. I said, yeah, I think he's got a, a good future. She said, how many matches has he had? I said, this was the first one. Oh, no, you're you're pulling my leg last. I said, no, Phyllis, this was his first match. Thanks for the compliment. But that was the point. You know, I, I didn't want people to know this is first match. The first impressions, as you know, sometimes are the only impressions and not right. always the best. So, uh, you know, the, there's no set time. Mm. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, and each guy is different. That's, I think, one of the problems with the people, uh, the writers who have never wrestled, the uh, people in talent relations now uh, who have never been part of the, the wrestling business but have uh, been in lacrosse or soccer or whatever. Uh, if you haven't, if 
you haven't danced a dance, you can't possibly understand all the intricacies of it. I, I don't care how big a fan you are or how long you've been watching. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't understand. I mean, it's like I played high school basketball, uh, but I don't believe that anybody in the NBA needs to sit down and listen to me explain to them how to play basketball because I have never played at that level. So I can't possibly understand it. But that's, uh, you know, uh, this, this is a t one of the toughest businesses in the world to learn. I, I have trained I, I, hundreds of people, and I, I, I actually don't know a number. But I've had, uh, you know, top athletes from several different things come and try wrestling and could make it. I've had guys who have never done anything else athletically turn out to be very solid workers. Uh, you know, it's, it's a strange thing. I had a young man who had uh, varsity letters in soccer at the University of Tennessee, mm -hmm. or University of Kentucky, I'm sorry, uh, the Southeastern Conference. Uh, and um, so he was been a big wrestling fan. After graduating from college, he came to my school. And he, I guess he was there seven, eight weeks and came to me and he said, Les, I'm just, he was frustrated. He said, God, I just, I can't get this done. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. When did you start playing soccer? Well, I was, I was seven years old or eight, I don't remember. And I said, okay, and now you're 22. You know, it took you how many years to become a proficient soccer player? One of the things that I was told years ago in our business is you're, you're a rookie the first five or six years. And that was when we were working five, six nights a week. Right. So you tell me, uh, and, and I don't care who they are. Uh, I, I shouldn't say I don't care who they are. There's the exception, obviously. But the average indie guy uh, it works once a week or, or once a month or a couple times a month, whatever the case. Um, you know, is he prepared to, to move up? No, he's really not. You know, and sometimes uh, he's only working with guys at his own level. So... Uh, you got to be tested. I, I know I've been asked, uh, you know, you put pressure on guys. I mean, you, you don't beat them up or, or anything, you know, but, but you, you screw with their heads a little bit to see how they handle the pressure. Because the higher you get in this business or, or in any profession, you know, I mean, I don't care if you're, you start as an actor, you know, a, a school play when you're in high school and try to go to a, uh, you know, to a major movie or whether you're playing, you know, um, Pee Wee soccer and then you want to become a professional, the higher you try to go, the more the pressure. You gotta be able to deal with that pressure, and which is, is part of the learning experience too. And if you've never had that put on you, you can't, you know, it, it's such a shock. It's like, a, you know, getting slapped in the face the minute you feel it. I, we did a uh, Ross Razor, I can't talk, Ross Graver, Pennsylvania, which is right outside of Pittsburgh. Back in 99, they had a big benefit show uh, for Mark Curtis. Brian Hildebrand, who passed away, was a WCW referee, if you recall, who, who died of cancer. Yes, yes. And yes. Um, I took I took a referee up there to work the show, who was going to end up being a wrestler and, and turned out to be a pretty good one. But at that, a lot of my guys who I started up put in as referees so they get comfortable in the ring in front of a crowd. But anyway, he refereed several matches, but one of them was a tag match with Chris Candido and uh, Shane Douglas against, I think it was Dean Malenko and Eddie Guerrero. I don't remember. No, it wasn't Eddie, but anyway, Dean and somebody. And on the way home, he was just, I mean, he talked about it. He was so blown away by the intensity and how quickly these guys shifted gears and were barking, you know, calling spots and, and moves. And, and he said, oh, my God. He said the electricity and the heat in that ring and the intensity was just amazing. And, of course, he had worked practice matches in our gym with some pretty good hands at the time. But at that high level, boys, it's, it's a whole different ball game. I mean, so, you know, you've got to be prepared for that. I know a lot of guys will say, well, you know, so-and-so in the Indies was a good worker, and they put him down in developmental, and we still haven't seen him come out of there. Well, you know, there's a good chance that he's not going to come out of there. He may have hit his plateau at the Indies, or he may not be able to handle that pressure. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's, it's a different thing. You know, you see college football players uh, who have been all, you know, all Americans or all sorts of, you know, awards and, and honors in college, and they get drafted into the CFL or the NFL or whatever and never heard of again because they had plateaued at the collegiate level. That was where they were good at that level. Ask them to take the step up. They just.
just didn't have the mental acuity or the physical attributes to do so. You know, it's, uh, it's you know, I, I think today, too, Richard, a lot of people think because, because our business is at work, because the general public understands that to varying degrees, a lot of young guys, well, it's an, you know, I can act, okay, congratulations. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, that's not what, you know, it's just they think it's, it's easy, and it's absolutely not. Although I've seen some indie shows that I wish I could drop a bomb in the middle of, <laughs> because they're they're, ins- they're they're insulting to our intelligence. I mean, they really are, you know. But there are hobbyists in our business now, which years ago there never were. I, I think one of the problems with with independence is if you, you know, the pro- if the promoters said, okay, everybody on this side of the ring, uh, this side of the room that wants to actually move up and, and make a living at this. And everybody on the other side of the room who just wants to go out to the bar and tell somebody they're a wrestler and can barely slap their ass with both hands. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't, you know, and as, as I learn more about the indies, that was, if, if I were booking an independent company today, or if I had a, a company today, I'd be, you know, are you in this for as a hobby? Okay, well, then I'm not going to push you as hard to become as, you know, I mean, I want you to be good. I want you to learn as much as you can but I'm not going to push you as hard mentally or physically as I am somebody that wants to go up. But I'm also not going to let you, the guys that want to go up, I'm going to put them with the better workers. And if you're just playing at this, then I'm going to let you play over here. You know, because I, I think that hinders the edgy. You know, there are guys that, that want to be good. When Danny Davis first started OVW, when I first started HWA, we were elitist. And then we realized somebody was taking money from these 135 pound guys. And, and, absolutely teach it of nothing mm-hmm. you know but uh you know you, again now there's more you know we well i was a junior heavyweight there were always you know there were two, uh, heavyweights and junior heavies back in the back in the day too mm-hmm. um so but but you know uh you still had to learn to wrestle that was the thing and uh junior heavyweight back then was two to 215 so he wasn't 135 pounds which is, you know, that's the other thing, too. You see guys, part of the thing as a kid was to look up in the ring and think, oh, my God, I hope I don't meet that guy in, a, in an alley. Mm-hmm. And I'm 72. I'll be 73 in October. And I watch some of these little scrawny kids in the ring, and I think, fight them? Nah, nah, I'll turn them over my knee and spank them like I would. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they're, they're not, I mean, you get my point, right? I mean, our business is an image business, so... You, you should look intimidating, whether you are. I mean, you can love, you know, birds and, and you know, and, and goldfish. But, I mean, the point is you need to look. And when I say that, you don't have to weigh 10,000 pounds. You know, you can be in great shape at 185, 190, and look like you're bigger than that if, right. if you're in good shape. That's the other thing, too. Uh, the weight room is, is part of our business, and I think there's a, lot, a great deal of the independents that aren't aware of that. Not, probably not even aware of what the hell a weight room is. You know, but, <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, again, you know, it's it's the raving. I'm the it's the ravings of an old guy who was taught the hard way to respect this business. And uh, that's the other part. I think it's just too easy to be in the business today. You know, there, you know, we talk about paying dues, but uh, there aren't. You know, I I, I was an, I was an, a, a jock in high school. I played football, basketball, baseball wrestled amateur at the YMCA. Right. Um, and I uh, thought I was a damn good athlete. I went to Boston in February 1960, 19 years old. And, uh, man, was I in for a rude awakening. They had to be my ass every <laughs> night for the first week or so. And I would limp back to my little room and um, they go, oh, my God, <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> That's the other thing, too. Yeah. I, I started training in February 1960. I had my first match July the 4th, 1960. When did they smart me up? They smart me up July the 4th. Huh. Um, they, I mean, they had us, you know, shooting with each other occasionally. But, but the way they taught us to work without actually telling us it was a work was they'd say, okay, Richard, you and let's, uh, we want you to practice the match. Now, you're not getting paid for this, so don't hurt each other. Apply the holes but don't put any pressure on. So basically they were teaching us to work. And I wish somebody teach some of these kids to work. Hmm. I lock up with some of these guys, these guys say, my God, are you mad at me? No, sir, why do you say that? I said, hell, 
you're stiff as a board. Right. That's you know that's the other thing too. You you can't see. I mean, you can watch a tape. I, I've heard kids say, "Well, I, I I learned to wrestle by watching tapes." You can't feel tapes. And uh, no, it's some like of the toughest guy, legitimately. Yeah, it's okay, like. No, no, I was just going to say, it's like it's like driving a car. Like, you can watch videos on how to drive a car, but unless you actually sit in the vehicle and, and you know, learn for yourself, like, that's not the same thing, so. Sure. Well, you know, and the art of our, this, these guys talking strong style, it's like, excuse me, uh, Harley Race, Danny Hodge, these are legitimate badasses. Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't want to fight either one of them, uh, regardless of my age. And um, yet, I've worked long matches with both these guys and never felt them virtually, you know? And, and you mentioned Brett earlier. Uh, Brett said, you know, uh, when you come to the dress room, if somebody's hurt, I don't care what went on in the ring. It wasn't a good match. And I see these kids kicking the hell out of each other. Yeah. And stiffening. I think, you know, you'd have done something like that with one of the old timers. <laughs> You'd been picking your ass up off the floor. Well, yeah, I mean, because well, like... You know, the thing, like, I've told some kids that were, you know, too stiff. I said, look, here's the deal. Back in the day, if I'd have felt you like that and we were having a match, it wouldn't have gone very long. First of all, I wouldn't have trusted you with my body. Second of all, uh, I figure you don't know what you're doing, and I'm going to end this as quick as I can right. uh, for my own protection and for no other reason, you know. It's, it's again, it's, when I say this, it's, it's not... I'm not adverse to young people. I'm not, I, I work, I love young people. It's just, if you're going to learn this, you know, anything, I don't care if it's selling insurance or building cars or um, wrestling. If you're going to do it, don't do it halfway. Right. Learn, you know, put your heart, your, that's the thing. Uh, Nigel uh, McGinnis, uh, we were, Ray Bonner was in Cincinnati uh, a few weeks ago and, and Pepper Parks who had trained at Dean Bisque and, and Nigel came up and had uh, lunch with me on Sunday. And we were talking, and I told him, I said, you know, Nigel came down from college to look at my gym and, and to meet me. He had sent for a brochure, and, and I let him get in the ring, and I, all we did was lock up. I think I didn't think, we, you know, we didn't do anything serious. But I said, I could feel his passion, his, you know, his excitement. To be, I mean, he'd never been in a wrestling ring in his life, and, and it just it oozed out of his pores. I mean, just locking up with him a little bit, I could feel that, you know. And, and that's, you know, and, and that's why I get upset and get on my high horse like I'm doing now and go <laughs> off on these tangents because I have such a love and passion and respect for this industry, you know? Well, no, I mean, you, you definitely hit the nail on the head because, like, it seems like a lot of these guys, a lot of these young guys, they work five, six days a week and they wrestle one day a week. And, you know, hearing the old stories from, from you know, from guys in the industry like yourself and even younger guys like guys like Chris Jericho's and Bret Hart's you know they wrestle five six seven days a week and you know they literally don't have two cents to rub together and they're traveling from city to city you know eating <laughs> you know slices of bread and you know big wedges of cheese because that's all they could afford because they just you know sure. they pour all their money into 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 wrestling yeah yeah well you know you you know the old saying is you get out of something what you put in it that's right and uh, you know it's like with with Nigel uh, my God, I don't know anybody's paid any more dues, uh, you know, of, of modern era. I, I mean, he could only get a six-month visa out of England at a time. And, you know, he finished, he was he was in uh, Kent State, which is in northeastern Ohio, uh, doing a, a exchange student thing. And uh, he came down and he said, I've got one more year at university going back, back home in England. And he said, then I want to come to trade. But he could only get a six-month visa, so he, he came to train. He had to go back home, save more money, uh, you know, work at a job. I know at one point uh, he was sleeping on a mattress in his buddy's kitchen floor, working double shifts at a restaurant, you know, to pay for his food and also to save money until the government decided to give him another six-month visa. Right. And, uh, you know, but, that, I mean, his dedication, I, there, I've never worked with anybody that had more uh, dedication uh, than he had. That's, that's the other thing I enjoy so much. You know, he's working with David and uh, David Jackson and I on his Wrestling Cares tournament, you know, starting in L.A. in April. And uh, yes, I'm just excited to have him working with us. 
yeah, if you want to, you know, you want to tell the listeners like what that's all about. Uh, you know, I I read the press release and you got a, a, a literal, you know, a, a veritable who's who of uh, pro wrestlers on the show. So. Yeah, well, you know, David came to me last year. Um, a mutual friend uh, put him on on to me, and he told me his concept, and he said, uh, "Could I? Would you like to come on board as a consultant and basically book or talent relation, whatever you want to call it?" Mm-hmm. And I said, "Yeah, because I like the concept." But basically, we're running a year-long tournament, and uh, David's background—I mean, he's been a wrestling fan like forever. He actually trained a little bit with Taz. Uh, in New Jersey uh, okay. a couple years ago, and he realized, you know, he realized that it just wasn't for he wasn't cut out for it. But he loved the business, and he still was a fan, and decided he wanted to get involved. His background is in fundraising uh, for charitable and nonprofit organizations, uh, business wise. So anyway, uh, Wrestling Cares, uh, and, and for those of you listening, you go to rest, uh, WrestlingCares.com. You'll see more about the the company and the and what we're doing. But it's a year long tournament. And each show, we're running uh, one show every two, every other month, and each show will be uh, for a different charity. I mean, you know, a percentage of, of the of the net profits will go to a different charity. Like this first one, April the 27th, is for the uh, Scott L. Schwartz uh, Children's Foundation. No, if you don't know Scott Scott Schwartz, if you watched, if you saw the movie Ocean's Eleven with George Clooney, yes, Scott was the big badass. Uh, bald-headed guy that was the gangster's bodyguard. Oh, yes, but that's he right. Broke, he broke him with Kowalski. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he, he's an actor. He broke him with Kowalski as a wrestler. He wrestled. He's now in the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, but he has his children's foundation. And so anyway, that that's for the first show. And uh, so, a little different concept. Uh, like I say, bracket A is uh, 16 guys. It'll be April in April show. And then June, bracket B, 16 more. Right. And um, the matches will all be 10 minutes, but we're going to we'll have a scoreboard up, like a, you know, a basketball game or a hockey game. Mm-hmm. We will have a clock as well, a la the basketball or, or, or hockey. And each match will be 10 minutes. If you score a pinfall or submission or, a, or you win on a count out, that's one point. Right. And... Uh, so at the end of the 10 minutes, the guy with the most points wins and moves into the next round. Right. Um, if, if somebody gets up 3-0 or 4-1, to then we stop the match because it's basically a route at that point. Right. And uh, the guy with the 3-0 moves to the next round. If, if say, you and I are in, in one of these matches and we're at 2-2 two, two or 2 at the end of the 10, there's a three-minute sudden death. Right. Uh, first guy to score a fall in the three minutes uh, is the one that moves to the next round. Okay. If neither guy scores a fall in that three minutes, they're both eliminated, and mm. an alternate is moved into that slot in mm. the next round. So something a little different. But, you know, time clocks, as you know, football, basketball, or hockey, soccer, are all important, and in wrestling they're really not. So no. we just thought, you know, that this would something, you know, it would make it a little more exciting, a little more interesting, and, and something a little different. You can thank Vince. And, for, um, uh, you can thank Vince. More, more about competition. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, uh, you can thank uh, Vince McMahon for, you know, getting rid of... Uh, you going to say? Uh, uh, you know, for... Uh, you can thank Vince McMahon for getting rid of time limits for, for matches. You know, he doesn't even... The announcers don't even announce uh, that anymore. Yeah. Well, I, I'd like to thank, to thank Vince for making me rich, but he hadn't done that yet. <laughs> thank you for something. But, but yeah, so that's, you know, it's and, and we want to make it, it's more like a competition. This is not about, uh, you know, enter, I mean, it's going to be entertaining. I mean, obviously, we hope we want it to be entertaining, but it, it's not about a lot of showmanship. It's about wrestling. And we want it to be more of a competition, you know. And uh, so the guys that we've recruited for this thing, we feel, are technically sound. Uh, you know, and uh, so it's, you know, it's more about the in-ring product. It's not like this guy's a heel and this guy's a baby face. We'll let the fans draw that conclusion. It's two athletes competing for a prize, and that prize is, of course, we're calling the tournament Race for the Ring. Yes. And uh, there will be a custom-made ring uh, awarded to the winner at the at the end of the uh, tournament. And um, the first, you know, all these guys are uh, technically, and we're technically sound. This first one, I got a Canadian boy, uh, Bobby Schreiber. We, I, 
you know, I'd heard a lot about Bobby and got a chance to look at him uh, when I was up in Edmonton, 